right, it is time. It's six o'clock and welcome in everybody. I'm Tom Callahan. Mike Haynes is joining me and uh, you've got a lot of hockey you want to talk about. We're going to talk about it with you. This is Talking Puck. Uh, I'm former voice of the National Predators, Mike, with the Colorado Avalanche. We are pleased to have you along. Mike, I'm pleased to have you here. We get to talk a little bit of hockey. <laughs> it is so nice to be able to do that. It re- you know, it's going to be a really fun show and looking forward to people having questions, having comments. And I know you and I, uh, you know, we're, we were uh, living for a long time. And so it's nice to be able to continue to do that. And it's not going to be a problem, I think, for you and I to fill as much time as we want to talking hockey. Absolutely not, because we both love this sport. And by the way, this is an interactive show. As Mike said, we're going to have some fun. We want it to be relaxed. We want it to be enjoyable. And we're, we're glad you're here to join us for it. Uh, to that end, if you're joining us on Twitch, Uh, or through TalkingPuck.com, where you can pick up the Twitch feed there as well. Uh, Feel free to jump in the chat if you've got questions for us. I know some people sent them ahead of time. I'm on Twitter, at Callahan on air, as you can see there on the screen. Um, And we go ahead and take questions. Um, I'm going to be monitoring through the chat as well. The chat room will be the main place to put those questions up. And each week, uh, we'll have a bunch of topics to talk about, but we'll also go ahead and talk about uh, things that fans may want to hear about. And so, uh, Mike, I want to start it off with uh, one of the the ones I thought would be the most fun. We're only a couple games into the season, and already we've got some teams that are 2-0, some that are 0-2, and a couple of those, I think, fit under the categories of a surprise. So I'm curious to know, what do you think? Uh, are your biggest surprises so far for teams, and it can go either way, good or bad. I, I well, it's not my nature, but I'm going bad. <laughs> it, San Jose. What's the story there with the Sharks? The team I thought that really had a chance to go to the Stanley Cup and really, be, you know, and, and possibly even win it uh, last season. They seem like they've really been on that cusp, and they have not gotten off to a good start, Tom, in, in this season. Uh, what's going on with the Sharks? Well, part of it is they ran into that buzzsaw called uh, Las Vegas. And I, right. I, I, I got to be honest with you, I, I have Vegas coming out of the West this year. I think they're going to be fantastic. Um, I, I, I had to think long and hard about that because I really do think the three teams in the Pacific are kind of in Arizona. Might be a surprise. We can talk about that a little that's, bit later. That, but, yeah, that's, that's, you know what, that's one of my picks for a later question you and I talked about. Yeah, yeah, but the Central Division is always tough, and so I think that the rich get richer in the Pacific because they get to beat up on some of the weaker sisters for a little while. So, uh, But, uh, gosh, I mean, that's, it, that's a great rivalry. I think that's the best rivalry going right now is – the one between San Jose and Vegas. I don't know if I can name, can you name a better current rivalry? That's, that's one of the things I think about is, you know, is there a better rivalry in the game right now, as far as current teams, I'm not talking historical. Let's not talk about Maple Leafs Canadians or anything like that, because that this is a different question. I'm talking right now in the NHL, who's a better rivalry than that. You're talking about strictly on the ice, because when you do talk about, Montreal, and Toronto, you talk Rangers, Islanders, that those kind of things. It it it's still palpable when you go to those games and you can feel, you know, just the hatred that the fans have for the other team. So those still feel to me like a real true. Then you have geographic, you have Anaheim and you know in Los Angeles, that sort of thing. But boy, in terms of of teams that just really don't like each other, I I, I think you have. I am a real believer. I don't know if you go along with this, but I think to really, truly have a rivalry really has hatred between the fans. The players don't like each other. They really feel it when you're watching them play. They have to have had some playoff experience against each other. Have that. And then maybe something is happening during the regular season. Uh, It's spilling over into the next possible game. Boy, it, it, right now, it is hard to beat um, Vegas and, and San Jose. That, that's a great rivalry happening right now. One of the reasons why I'm not picking San Jose for the 0-2 surprise is because they started with Vegas, and I knew it was going to be mm-hmm. tough. Um, I thought that was going to be a tough start to the season for them. But I will tell you who I have as an 0-2 surprise is Dallas. Dallas. That's, that was my other pick. You're oh, absolutely okay. right. Because so much expectation there. Oh, they went out and they tried so hard to make this team better. They tried so hard. They picked up new, and they did a good job. Off I season, think. Tom. It's been several years now. I mean, they had the coaching change. 
they changed their goaltender. They they have you know they have really really tried. They they just feel like they're just right on that edge of becoming one of the premier teams, and they just can't get over that hurdle, can they? And I thought that this might be the now. It's a slow start. I know they got some new moving pieces in there. Uh, I I thought they were going to be better, but. They didn't score last year. They were 29th in the league in goals. Uh, Shocking for them. It is, especially with the talent they have. And then bringing in Pavelski, I thought right. would be that would be great. But three, terrific leader. Yep, good. Three, I mean, he was end up being a great captain there in in uh, San Jose. And a, to me, it's been one of those real clutch guys too. You know, when you need yeah. the big goal, he's he's there. But they have so much offensive talent. They've just got to be shaking their heads. Why aren't they scoring more? Yeah, and uh, so if their scoring woes continue, I mean, they made the playoffs last year despite not scoring a whole lot of goals. But yikes, I I don't know. That's gonna be that's gonna be a tough one for me. And actually, yeah, especially a, in that division. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, well, that's it. In the central, you I, get buried. It quickly, absolutely, because there are some teams that are that's gonna that has been since the, since they realigned things and made that central division. I'm not saying every single year, but I bet you if you look at it overall since they realigned things, this division, the bottom. Yeah, and I mean realignment. It's it's funny because you and I might be a little biased because we spent a lot of time uh, in the central division. Obviously, you with Colorado, me with Nashville, but I really think it is the toughest division in in hockey and has been for a while. And uh, I grew up with the old Adams division as a Buffalo Sabers fan, and you know that was a tough physically tough oh, division yeah. you know and i think it's a little different uh these days but um speaking of which uh, and being a buffalo fan they're one of my surprises at 2-0 and as are the rangers and the ducks um now dallas eakins being coach in anaheim i've gotten to watch him in san diego the last couple of years and then when he got promoted to the ducks it wasn't a big surprise in that organization they've known for a long time he was going to be the guy now the question really becomes was randy carlisle the difference for that team was coaching the difference and is Dallas Eakins now yeah. going to be the difference? Well, he, he won, you know, Randy won a cup. It's you, you, right, you, know, you right, always, right. you always have that on your resume. Don't you? When, yeah. When you've done that, but the game has evolved. It has changed. Uh, and, and you have to have the way that the game is being played now. I mean, it's speed. It's, it's just, it's not, it's not that, kind of game that it used to be so I, I think you have to have I, I like those coaches especially that have come up through the minors who have coached in the minor leagues and have seen uh you know these players and what in the development and I think also dealing with younger players it's different now Tom would you agree with me that that how you coach is different than it was even five years ago you know it's interesting Barry Trotz uh when he was in Nashville really i think understood it a lot more than most people and, and and number one he's one of my favorite human beings of the world let alone hockey person but uh ball he was there a long time he, he saw a lot of changes for he, one team yeah he really did and he put it the best i've ever heard anybody put it is that each of these guys is now they're not just hockey players they're their own little corporation and that's the way he looks at it is they all have their own interests to look out for they all are a little business unto themselves with an agent and you know, people to take care of. And, and some of them have a lot of outside business interest, to, whether it's endorsements or other things they're doing. But there's so much money in the game, Mike. And I think that that's part of it is the money has changed things for better or worse. This is where we are now. Yeah, but but it has it changed it for a select few. Seeing a league now and even more so in this off season, when I look at the contracts that were given to a, a select few or the players, are we seeing a handful of guys, Tom, that are these corporations, these individuals, like the, the just almost interchangeable players? You know, just a few. Uh, I, that's how I, that's at least how I'm looking at it now. It's, it's different. I, I like what Barry Trot said about that, but I don't think, I don't think you could say every single player in the NHL is like that now. I think we've, we're starting to see, and I think it's only going to get more and more unless things change in the next, um, next bargaining agreement with the players and the league if that changes things. But I, I don't see how it will. I think you have a select few players who are making the big money and then everybody else. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I can't say that you're wrong with that because I feel like that's exactly where it is, is you're always going to have those few, the the haves and the have-nots, right? I mean, that's, that's oh, anything. Oh, more so than ever now in this league. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it's you know, they say the NFL's a quarterback-driven league and that's where all the money goes, but sometimes when you pay your quarterback, you can't win anymore, and that's where the business decision comes in. Um, and I think that No better example than the Chicago Blackhawks. Sure. There? Sure, and, and you know what? They paid for their three cups, and they got them, but now they're dealing with it. Right. Well, but they, but now for their their three cups. Right. You know they had they had to slice guys as they went along, and they did a great job with that. When you've got your your two top guys making the ten million dollars, boy, it doesn't you know it 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 makes it tough. It makes it tough, and then. I, I just look at I, – I wonder about – Toronto is the most interesting one with me in terms of the salaries, guys who are getting that, and, and you haven't won yet, but yet you've got some players that are making huge amounts of money. How, how, do, you, how do you develop? How do you keep doing that with that team? And now – and other teams are going through this. Yeah. And, and you know, well, I we asked that question for years, didn't we? In the Central Division, when I was sitting there and, and looking at – I'm like, okay, this has got to be the year these guys – get bit by the cap and then somehow they wouldn't stan bowman would juggle some things and move some guys along and that's bit though eventually yeah yeah well it, it exactly and they're they're kind of paying for it now because they are tied into some contracts that quite frankly are albatrosses um but that's again it's the nature of the beast now what's worse i think is if you're chicago they were lucky enough to draft some incredible talent they won three cups off it if you mortgage the farm don't win the cups that's even worse because now you're stuck paying for it and you didn't win. And I think there's a couple of teams in those windows right now. And, uh, and that's it's my I, thing about Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely. had decided you're, I mean, you're what you're paying Marner. You've got Matthews and Tavares, and then they're going to have to make a decision on what they want to do with Anderson at some point. And so, you know, and Tyson Berry now is going to be up for a contract depending on how he plays for them. I mean, you, and they haven't won anything. First round, and that's well, later we're going to talk about coaches under the. Uh, I'm going to give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, and that's something we're going to talk about later. Is it's under the spotlight here? <laughs> that's right. We're definitely going to be talking about that a little later on. In fact, um, we've got a couple more topics we want to get to, and we've got a question here uh, talking about Seattle. So what we're going to do? We're just going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. And uh, when we come back. Uh, we will dive into uh, a question we have on Seattle coming in and realignment, uh, which is a good one. And, and we'll talk about that and cover that. And also, um, we're going to pose one to you now. So if you want to get active in the chat about this, feel free. But we're looking for one team in each conference, one team in the East and the West that you think, A, made the playoffs last year but won't this year, and B, one that didn't make the playoffs last year but will this year. And so Mike and I will discuss when we come back on Talking Puck. All right, we got a little break in there, and so we can shift gears and transition over to uh, our second segment here in Talking Puck. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. We do appreciate you being here, being a part of the show. Uh, Mike Haynes, uh, Avalanche uh, NHL voice for several seasons, and also, uh, Mike, as I put up on your bio there, five re five-time regional Emmy Award winner. Congratulations. I did not know that about you. I knew about the Stanley Cups, didn't know about the Emmys. Over here, over my shoulder. <laughs> they look uh, pretty. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't call. Uh, you know what? I, I bought them on eBay, so they they really look nice, though, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they're very. They're very. They don't shiny. have my name on them, but that's. I'll take care of that another time. Yes, they're very shiny. They look nice. They they give us some extra added cred here. So, uh, and, and let's talk. <laughs> I don't know about that. Wow. But yeah, no, I was, I was with them for twenty three years. But the, you know what? I, this is thank you, Tom. And and this was. 
I know this is your idea, and and thank you so much for including me in it. I, uh, I could talk hockey 24 hours a day, so uh, this is so much fun to be able to do this and to be able to do it with you. I have so much respect for your hockey knowledge, so appreciate you letting me be part of this. And I understand, and, and also um, – we will have next week. Will Jay be joining us? Jay well? Levin will be joining us, and, and thanks for pointing that out. Um, Jay has a great agent because first week, first show, he's on vacation. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't know who his guy is. but I, we, for we, that, or is he still getting his salary? So. <laughs> um, you know what? I, we haven't talked about that yet, but uh, I don't, <laughs> what's, what's half of free? <laughs> i don't know the last uh, year the last couple of years uh, i've been uh, <laughs> been trying to figure that out yeah yeah oh i hear you i hear you I'm right there with you so uh but tom callahan and mike haynes here with you as you can see i'm at callahan on air on twitter we've got to get mike on on twitter at some point uh we'll, we'll figure this out we'll get him going on this but um, so, well, of course yes let's so we do have a question that came in through the chat and i want to go ahead and uh talk about that um, the question was, looking ahead to Seattle's entry into the league, do we feel the natural move is Arizona to the Central and Seattle into the Pacific Division? Because, Mike, that's what they say they're going to do, and, and uh, I guess the decision's pretty much already been made, but geographically it's still a little weird. Um, you being what, else would you, what else would you do, though? Right, and you being based in Denver, I think, you know, the Avalanche were the, the – furthest flung team if you will um along you know it just does that what else could you do because you don't want to move vegas out of the pacific they really have made i thought a huge inroads and really as we talk about the sharks rivalry it's become a big deal to where you, I, it's 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 tough because you do kind of you have um colorado right there in the middle there's no there's nobody the closest team really is probably vegas or arizona uh, it, it does make sense, I think, to, to probably move Arizona into the Central Division. What's interesting to me is I think they're a team on the uptick. I think that's a team that's improving. It's only going to make the Central Division that much tougher. But I, you know what? I don't, I don't know whether you – are you is everybody okay with how the teams are aligned? You know about Nashville. If you look at geographically – should they be should they be in the eastern conference well it's like that around right Do you, is columbus maybe should they go back to the west uh, or, or and they, they they oh detroit would hate that detroit hated detroit being in the western it. conference of course they would yeah, well, but you know their what? eastern time zone they don't want to be in I, the west i'm there this <laughs> as well yeah, it's it, it's a hard it, question. Geographically, how do you slice this league up? And and actually, you have no choice but to put Seattle in the Pacific. They, they have yes, to go there. Yes, that, they that. do. Mm -hmm. So it's just I think you have to. If you're going to keep the Western Conference together, which obviously they need to, they've got they got a certain amount of they got 15 teams over in the or, or 16 teams, excuse me, in the East, and now Seattle makes 16 in the West. So it makes sense that you have to take somebody out of the in the central and it's it has to be either vegas or arizona and any other option not not one that works um and i think arizona was just the most likely candidate to move over they were they were the ones that you'd look at and say okay these are these are the guys i mean it it, it yeah. it's also interesting too time zone wise because in arizona um the, the time doesn't change, meaning there's no spring ahead, there's no fall back. So right. mountain part of the year right, but part of the year they're on the same on the same time zone with Colorado, right? And, Cor uh, correct. Mountain? So that'll be coming up here uh, as as mountain time falls back. Um, and so our our clocks now I'm I'm in Arizona right now. The clocks here won't change. And so we'll end up on mountain time throughout the winter. And then in the summer, we basically are Pacific time um, because right. of that. So, you know, does that help or hinder Arizona? I think it's easier for a team to play games on TV earlier um, in the day than it would be. For instance, when Dallas, remember when Dallas was in the Pacific, they were playing, yes, yeah, two hours away. That was tough for them. That was really hard. Sure. That, that's a tough thing. Road games are starting at 930 at night. Half your fan base is not being able to watch. You're not really getting kids to watch your hockey team and grow up as Stars fans. That's tough. 
think that was that, that was part of what um you know, like Detroit that was their argument right that you know that they yeah. were in the eastern time zone and then they were going to have they were going out and playing you know the pacific time zone and you know it was causing some problems so i, I don't it makes i guess i guess it makes sense for what what's your what are you hearing in terms of Seattle coming in and uh, general manager possible coaches what uh, and what do you think uh of you know how how successful it's going to be i i'll tell you i have uh, a brother who lives in Seattle, and it's an interesting sports market. I think. Um, I, I think you're, you'll you'll have a natural rivalry with Vancouver. Yes. No, I don't know if it's a great. I I think that just because of the nature of the 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 majority of the kind of people who live there, but yet, you know, the Mariners do pretty well. The Seahawks have done well. Soccer team there draws. Do they ever? They, yeah. They're crazy about their soccer team there, um, and they've had they've had the Western Hockey League, the junior team there for for years, and they do okay. Do you think it's going to be a success? I I think Seattle's going to be a success on and off the ice for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you look at the way the league set up Vegas, um, and, and now mind you, a lot of that came down to the shrewd uh, deals that were done in and around the expansion draft. Um, and, and that team was set up well, I think. And Seattle is going to be set up under a similar premise. They're the only team coming in. Um, GMs might have a little bit more time to plan, but I still think there are teams that are going to be hamstrung and are going to lose bigger name talent in an expansion draft, whether they want to or not. Uh, and part of that may be this time. It's, it's the, uh, the biggest number one thing is who they end up in the expansion draft getting as a goalie. I mean, yeah. Flurry made a huge difference sure. for that team. Not only on the ice, but what a what a great guy to have in your community too. Yeah, uh, so they were very fortunate in the goalie that they got. And I actually had a chance to visit Seattle uh, this past winter. Listen to this; you're gonna love this, Mike. When I went up there, uh, it was the worst winter weather they had had since 1926. <laughs> I picked the worst time to go see the city of Seattle, but the people were super nice. They were great. And, and you know what? I get the vibe that Seattle loves the city of Seattle. They they love their oh. identity. Um, and yeah. and oh, that's right now part of that. It's includes, a great sports town. Right. You think it's a good sports town? You I do. I you think it's a good And here's why. I think people are rallying around the identity of Seattle sports teams as part of that fabric of the city of Seattle now. Um, I don't know if that was always the case or not. I, I hadn't been there previously, but I think the Sounders – really have a lot of people on Goodness. board, um, as you mentioned. And the Seahawks winning has really brought people in. And I just feel like now that, you know, uh, Seattle is kind of, I don't know that the secret's out uh, so much as, you know, it's kind of, it's funny. I was in Nashville when they went through the quote-unquote it city phase that they're still kind of going through. Um, you know, you it along with it, you do glom onto your sports teams, and it does become a bigger deal. And I think that that's where Seattle is and where they're heading, and I think this team will be a huge success. I don't know, did you did you happen to look at housing prices when you were there in Seattle? Ooh, wow. Oh, my. You, you'd fall down. You can't even believe yeah. what uh, people are just flocking there, and the, the housing prices are out of this world right now. So it, it, I don't know. It, it it's an interesting place to live. It's certainly with, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, it's a lot of tech things going on there and there's yeah. people with, there's people with money and it's, it, it, it'd be interesting that, I mean, I, I, I think they still hurt over the loss of the supersonics. I know that there's a lot of, still a lot of basketball fans who love to have the NBA back. And maybe once they get it, I don't, I don't know what, do you know what, what they're doing arena wise? Is, is it going to be good to have hockey and basketball in? I know they're redoing the old arena, right? Isn't yes. So, so Key Arena is the uh, used older... to be the place the Supersonics played, right? Yes. And so, what they have to do architecturally, uh, it was voted they need to keep the roof of the facility. It was voted uh, to be architecturally significant, historically architecturally significant. So they can't <laughs> touch the roof. Everything under the roof is fair game. So um, it's now, the last time I read the project cost, it was almost a $700 million to basically gut Key Arena. But I think they are going to retrofit it for NBA as well. Now, the NBA has said several times they're not interested in expanding. They kind of like where they're at. Um, 
you know, who are you going to move? I'm sure you can point fingers at a few franchises like you can in the world of hockey, like you can in the world of football, you, you know. Um, but I don't think unless the NBA expands probably by four – that the NBA is going to expand, they're not going to bring in one or two more teams. I think that um, they have their nice round number and they're cool with where they're at. So, but but they, um, Seattle would love to have an NBA team back. They really do feel jilted by the SuperSonics. I think so. But uh, well, it'd be uh, I, hopefully it's a big success. I think there was there, so much success. Yeah. In Vegas. Yeah. That, 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 so high now in the NHL as to oh you can come right in you, you, you know you know what you can do you can go your first year you can go right to the Stanley Cup <laughs> I mean yeah, it's, well, just, it's crazy isn't it? it it is crazy to imagine oh, you saw what happened in Nashville like you know I remember all you know when the league went through kind of that drip of of bringing teams in with Minnesota and Columbus and Nashville and you know they went through that and and those were teams that had that had much success right away so it, they, if I don't know. I just don't know whether the aberration for what Vegas did, the, the rules. And if you're Seattle, you you want those same you want those same rules. You want those same um, drafting ability. You want that same sort of thing that was given to Vegas to try and make them successful early. You want to make sure that you're getting that same sort of thing that in the older days that boy they certainly didn't have that for expansion teams. Well, and that's no. it. They want to set them up for success nowadays, and that's the most important thing. The NHL wants to see the teams do well right away, and with good reason. Vegas in a brand-new arena, state-of-the-art stuff, and look at how they took off. And the NHL was smart to get in there ahead of the Raiders and get in there and grab that market. They own that market now, and that was a really important thing for them to get there early. Would they have done that if they didn't win? So the same thing in Seattle. You Seattle, in Vegas – only major league team until the Raiders come in, right? But right. in Seattle, if you don't have success right away, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of options. Uh, if you're a sports sports person, uh, even you know it's not that far away to go to the Canucks game. Do you want to? If you really want to see NHL hockey, but I, I think it where they need to be successful right away. There's there's just too much other things going on there. Yeah, I I would I would concur with that, and uh, that's yeah. We'll we'll see what it's going to be. It's going to be here before you know it, a couple of years. But uh, well, good question, great question, and uh, certainly feel free to keep submitting through the chat uh, here. But uh, what I wanted to get to with this segment uh, that we never quite got to, Mike. Um, so I have this question from Jay Levin, who again will be back next week. Jay is out this week; he'll be rejoining us, uh, and Jay's big in the capology and the fancy stats and he explains a lot of things and he's really good at going into that um, and he will be a regular part of the program but he he said to me last week on twitter he said okay eastern conference western conference give me one team that made the playoffs last year won't this year and one that um, didn't make it but will this year so here's what i have eastern conference i have columbus out i don't think columbus yeah. makes it back in i think buffalo under ralph Kruger is going to be the team that gets in in the West, I think Winnipeg is out because they their defense has been dismantled. I know Big Buff is coming back, or at least I feel in my heart he's coming back. But when, who knows? Um, and I think the Central's just too tough to have three defensemen out uh, from your core last year and now a fourth with Buffalo not there. And then I think Arizona, if anybody can get in, I think it's Arizona. Um, Jay said he thinks the West – the same teams are in and out this year, but in the East. So he agreed with Columbus, but then he said the Devils getting in. That, to me, is a lot of weight to put on the shoulders of a young Jack Hughes. Yeah. I mean, they're they're an improving team. All right, out of the – out of the – I can't believe it. I got three out of the four. I got in the West uh, that made it that will miss. I got Winnipeg in the West. In the East, Columbus. I think that's an easy pick. I think Columbus. That I mean, they just last year made the playoffs, and and then uh, that that's not the same team. And I will agree with you on Arizona. But here's my pick in the East for a team that didn't make it make the playoffs, and I'm and I'm doing it because a couple of guys they acquire, especially their goaltender. But I think it's the coaching. I think Florida, Bill. We'll turn that thing around in a hurry. I think if Bobrovsky has a good season, Florida will make the playoffs. 
Well, you just previewed the next segment with uh, when we talk about players <laughs> and coaches under the microscope, because because Quinville's right. got to come up, right? I almost is it possible for a guy with that many rings to go to a new place to be a coach and to almost fly under the radar? Did anybody? Talk about Florida. Did anybody talk about Joel Quinville? I didn't hear any it, chatter. It's, it's the it's the Florida syndrome. It, it just is a. It has been a franchise talked about. I mean, I, I in 1996, um, I was broadcasting, and and that was the team uh, that uh, Colorado faced in the in the Stanley Cup. I don't know how they got there, and then they got swept. But uh, that it's just a team that has found more ways to just do things that just, you know, just hurt themselves. But what a great move. Uh, Quenville, he's been a winner in St. Louis. He was a winner in Colorado, and he was obviously a great winner in uh, Chicago. Uh, and I think, you know, you, you get a Bravovsky, a Vesna Trophy, uh, a caliber goaltender can make a huge difference. And I, I'm, I, I just think if, if Quenville's – and I, I knowing him – you know him, but I know him because he, he coached here. Uh, boy, that guy, if he's still got that fire that, that he's always had. You look on the bench who looks more how he is. Because I know the guy. Or angry than Joe Gwenville does on the bench. It, uh, you know what? He, look, he just looks like he's just always in a bad mood, but he's, he's, he's <laughs> one of the nicest. He's a great person. He really is. But is he intense? And is he a great coach? Uh, I just think he's he's going to make a huge difference down there. I, I, I'll i be shocked. The only thing that could mess it up if they um moves that are so bad that he can't win with those players. But if they give him decent players and then they give him an opportunity to win that guy could win hockey games he's just a great coach i think florida has a good core i think they've had one for a while i think sergey bobrovsky is going to give them a really good goaltender i think that that team is better than people realize and maybe with a guy uh, like cosmo being a superstar in the league don't you think yeah and, and you know what honestly if if quenville can work that magic um mm -hmm. and i think he can there's no reason to think they can't make the playoffs. I like your pick. I, I like it a lot. But I also – and the reason I chose Buffalo was very much the same thing. It's coaching. Um, they don't have the superstar goaltender, I think, that, that Florida does. But I think you look at uh, the coaching change in Buffalo to Ralph Kruger, who I think a lot of Oilers fans feel did not get a fair shake uh, under the old regime, the old boy network up there in Edmonton. And I think that, you know, he's a guy who can make a big difference with Buffalo, which is laden with talent. But has severely underproduced so far, and uh, it's right. been it's been disappointing, I think, to a lot of Sabres fans. And maybe this is the year that changes a bit. I uh, and I'll probably mention this time after time all season, just because I'm so proud. But my daughter just left. Uh, she's a freshman going to Buffalo State and playing uh, hockey there. Uh, the State Bengals. So she she just started. In fact, they start uh, real practice tomorrow. But. Uh, she's going to the game uh, on on the ninth. They're playing Montreal, but uh, she was just filling me in on uh, that. You know, it, there, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for the team in town. That uh, people are, are, you know, they're great fans there. When you you know that, they're yeah, just, they've just they're just great fans, and they want that team to win so much. And if that team starts winning again and and starts really competing. Uh, it'll it that 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 town will just fall all over themselves rooting for that team and it'll be it'll be great it's good for the sport if buffalo is doing well because it's a great hockey town yeah it, it, it's a it's a great sports town and they wear their their heart on their painted faces and their sleeves so um yep. it, it'd be interesting to see how that one's all going to pan out but so a lot of uh, a lot of great talk here so far mike we've got one more segment to get to when we come back uh and again feel free to interact with us in the chat on twitch uh, also on Twitter, I'm at Callahan on air. If you want to talk to me over there as well, I'm keeping an eye on, on Twitter. Uh, but we're going to talk about players and or coaches under the microscope. And we'll do that when we come back here in just a little bit.
right, and we are back on Talking Puck. Thanks for joining us here on Twitch. Also, TalkingPuck.com. Uh, I'm actually going to see uh, if I can get Mike to even write a little bit for the website uh, for Talking Puck. <laughs> we'll see if we can get him to dust off the old keyboard there and throw some opinion pieces up. But uh, we're going to be doing this Add show. grammar, yeah. <laughs> Take a look. All right, I'll, t I'll, I'll make sure I run over that first before we get anything going on that. But uh, we're going to be doing this, Mike, every Sunday, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific throughout the hockey season. And just like we are now, we're taking questions from the chat, from Twitter. Uh, we come in with some topics of our own, and we're just going to talk some hockey and enjoy ourselves. It is just, it's just so exciting to be able to – uh, talk hockey and uh, you know normally i'm just walking around the house talking to myself so tom it's nice to have somebody that is actually listening and uh and usually i disagree with myself so if this is this is uh, if you start disagreeing with me i'll be used to this so that's great that's, i'm looking forward to it well, that's fair i'm sure we'll have some disagreements as we go along i actually wanted to ask you a guy that's in your backyard in denver um nazim kadri a little bit of a slow start with the avs a guy who I don't want to say he played his way out of Toronto, but he might have suspended his way out of Toronto because he gets suspended during the playoffs. It cost him a playoff uh, round, in my opinion. Um, and just, you know, he scored 30 goals a couple of times, so he's always going to get a chance. And I think going to Colorado and being on the top six of what is an extremely dangerous offensive team could pay huge dividends uh, for Kadri, for the Avalanche, if everything comes together. The question is, does the player mature? Um, does he blend in in the abs a little bit more? Certainly, as you well know, it is a completely different hockey market in Denver than uh, that is from Toronto as far as just being with that, uh, the spotlight on you every single day and, and the media down your throat all the time. It's not quite that bad in Denver, is it? Oh, oh not even close. There's, there's hardly any criticism of, you know, of players and there's barely any i mean the, the media car it's look it's it's a it's a broncos town you know and 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 when the football season's going on that's that's 99 percent of the coverage uh so that part is different. i i am i am always fascinated to play through all in toronto and, and to a degree of maybe, maybe a boston or a new york the, but but those kind of markets or vancouver i, I think you could say that uh 24-hour television devoted to that team uh and and thrive in it and want to do it and it's interesting to me guys grew up in that area and think that they want to play there right and then when they get there it's like oh man it's just too much it's too much i mean it's front page news if they change up line combinations at practice some guys though tom just thrive in it they love it they love the spotlight uh they love those big moments they love sitting in the locker room and talking uh and being interviewed and and they they thrive on it and they really enjoy it while some guys don't so i i, I don't know i don't know um to, to determine whether this is a good move for him trying to get out from under that spotlight. But I, I think it's fair to say we're t the, the media there, and, and I think, would you agree with me, that there were times where uh, they were critical of, of the way that he played. And I wonder if, the, if it's eventually going to be a better situation for him where he doesn't have to live under the microscope. I think Critical's being polite. Um, I think the media really took it to him a lot of times. Um, so, and sometimes he deserved it, let's be honest. Um, the player behavior really was the concern, I think, for everybody in Toronto. Not, it wasn't just the media. It was the team as well. Um, you know, Kadri. I was just reading an article about him on Sportsnet not too long ago where he said he was still kind of surprised by the trade. Even after he turned down a trade to Calgary, thought about it for several days, he still didn't quite think Toronto was going to move on from him, and then they sent him over to uh, the Avalanche. I think the change of scenery is going to be good for him. I think it's it's a chance for him to really kind of pick up and get it going uh, and show that he can still be a 30-goal, 60-70 point guy uh, and can be a big contributor to a team that I think is going to do pretty well this year. But he's he's got to get it under control. And again, to me, it's just the, the maturity level of the player, of the person, both on and off the ice. 
I think part of the reason you, you want a guy like that and something maybe that was missing uh, it, for them, sandpaper, having a guy with a little bit of an edge. And I, I, I think that's one of the things they looked at and, and thought that this we're, we're missing this. We don't have this, especially down the middle. Uh, and so online, you want, you want a guy who – who could disrupt things and get under you know the skin of the other team and just sort of do that, but take bad penalties. You don't want to cost your team some things, but you, you want to. That's one area I think that they were missing, and they felt that that was uh, a guy that they could go out and when they made that big trade uh, would come in and, and give them that type of a player. But boy, that's a it's a fine line though between causing causing trouble against the other team and causing your own team some trouble. Oh, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. And speaking of which, guys under the microscope, uh, everybody right. in Toronto's under the microscope. Uh, but there were seven... 24 hours a day. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's crazy. But seven new head coaches in the NHL this year. Ralph Kruger in Buffalo, Dallas Aikens in Anaheim, which we already talked about, Quenville in Florida. Uh, then you had Tom McClellan with the LA Kings. Dave Tippett goes to Edmonton. DJ Smith in Ottawa. Elaine Vigneault uh, in Philadelphia. Out of all of those, uh, Mike, let's start with the new coaches first. Who do you think is going to be watched the most? Where are the expectations highest? Philadelphia. So that's that's a tough town. That's a really tough town. They they love the Flyers there, and they 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 seem to have gone through a lot of coaches lately, haven't they? Yes. I, that, that's a that's he's a really good coach though. He's really good, you know. Uh, liked him in uh, in Vancouver with the Rangers, uh, but you know, in, in Philadelphia, uh, that's you know the leash is pretty short. So I, I think he's definitely under the microscope. One name, let me just throw this at you, and just out of it, just, and it had nothing to do with the fact that we spend all that time talking about Toronto. But and I know he's got the big contract, the big expectations. But Mike Babcock, he's a little bit under the microscope. If, if they get knocked out in the first round again? So it's funny because I thought Mike Babcock, John Cooper. Um, and you look, they're not because they're just not. Uh, you know, everybody thinks Babcock is, is the way and, and he's, he's going to be just fine. John Cooper won way too many games last year with Tampa Bay, even though they got swept in the first round. But, yeah, I can agree with that from a standpoint of – the pressure is on to win in Toronto right now because of where they are cap-wise. I think it's huge. You mentioned it earlier. They just had to pay Marner. They just had to pay Matthews. They're paying Tavares. Now you're going to have a couple more guys coming up here, and they're, got, they're going to be in Holy salary God. cap hell in a couple of seasons. So they better they better win. They, but they got to get past the first round, which yeah. they haven't done. Yeah, well, and maybe that's uh, part of the thinking of, of Caudry going out addition by subtraction. I don't know, but you, you lose the grit and the sandpaper. What do you do if you come up against Boston again? That's uh, that's what you got to answer that question. Right. Oh, I I know. I, and I, I and we we talked about him earlier too. And I don't necessarily. I think in the hockey world itself, looking at Quenville in Florida and and. It's a real proving uh, ground for him. Uh, when he went to St. Louis, got that turned around pretty pretty well. And I, I remember he, you know, he went to the uh, Western Conference Finals. I want to say it was pretty it was early on in his coaching career there in St. Louis. Had he had a couple of good runs uh, in Colorado, and obviously was phenomenal in Chicago. But I think I think people are looking to look and and, and think good a coach great spot in chicago with an amazingly talented team and they won that way yeah i i think i think the hockey world tom takes a look at joel quinville and goes okay you everybody thinks you're this great coach can you do it with a florida panthers team that has not been very good lately yeah i th i think I, that's I mean, fair I, I mean there's security there he's there they've given him the years they give him the money but i, I think that i think in the hockey world people want to see how good a coach is this guy when, I, when you don't have Patrick yeah. Kane and Jonathan Taves and so on and so forth? couple more guys that I want to put in there just to uh, – I want to get to some of the players here. Um, but I think Craig Berube, people are going to be looking at this year. Can he yeah. keep the role going in St. Louis? Bruce Boudreaux 
is always under the microscope no matter where he is. But Minnesota <laughs> has to improve this year. They have to make the playoffs. Pete DeBoer in San Jose, one of the teams we talked about up top, he's under my microscope because the Sharks, I think their window's closing, and they still don't have a goaltender in my opinion. And then Paul Maurice in Winnipeg, um, just from a standpoint of, okay, so you know – that you've lost half your decor. Um, you're going through some issues right now with your franchise, but can you keep them competitive? Can you get them back into that push? I think those are all legitimate ones, but out of all those, maybe Boudreaux and DeBoer. What happens, Mike, if the Sharks get off to a really slow start? Boy, uh, I, I think they've had... Don't you think they've had enough success the last couple of years that he's going to get the benefit of the doubt to get it turned around and get going again? I think I think that he does myself. I th- I would agree with you in Winnipeg about Winnipeg, Paul Maurice. He, you know, Kevin Shoveldey off the the general manager there. Uh, he he is built that team. Now I, you know, you you, lo- you lost some good defensemen. Uh, Myers, um, and and now what? Bufflin is out, right? We don't even know. Well, Bufflin that, doesn't even know if he's coming back. We're gonna play again, right? Yeah. Uh, so they, you know, something is they've they've been very patient. I think those are really good fans there in Winnipeg, and and I think they thought it by this point that they would have at least gone to the Stanley Cup uh, championship, but uh, you know if if. Boy, if they don't, if, especially as tough as that central division is, if they don't get off to a good start and and really solidify themselves, I, I I'm I'm right with you. I I think he's a guy that's really under the microscope, especially when you get into those Canadian towns and a Winnipeg, especially where that's it. That's the only game in town. That's all they talk about, uh, and and they dissect every move a coach is making. And uh, boy, Kevin uh, Shovel Day Off has been very patient with the, with the coaches that he's had through the years. But, you know, the pressure's on him, too, as a general manager. They've given him uh, all this time, and they've given him the resources to, to win. And I think the pressure's on and, and on that franchise to really, really have a good season. All right. Well, a couple of uh, players let's talk about. We talked about coaches. So players for me um... – a couple of guys who didn't get along on the Pittsburgh Penguins last year, Evgeny Malkin and Phil Kessel. They have been separated by several time zones. Um, but now I think the onus is on both of them. Can Malkin have a bounce back year and the Penguins really have a bounce back year? You talk about a team. There's several teams in the NHL that are getting towards the end of their windows just because their superstars are aging. The Penguins are one of them. And then Arizona didn't have the ability to score goals. Uh, and for the attention that there is on hockey in the desert, I think all of it has to be on Phil Kessel. Sure. Uh, I, I, I agree. I, that's, that's a guy who he has scored in his career, but now, now he's going to have to do it there. Do you think having played, talked about like Toronto where he did, and Pittsburgh is, is a great hockey town. And a lot of focus on the Penguins because of their success. Do you think that he thrive that he's better off being in, in a town like uh, Phoenix and playing uh, for the Coyotes? I I think it might actually benefit him. Yes, I think yeah. that uh, right. he he could come in here and kind of I don't want to say relax. That's not the right word, but it's not the pressure cooker of some of those other hockey intense markets. Maybe it will benefit him. Another guy who a change of scenery could really do him good. Um, he might be that kind of guy who, you know, is he can still score. You know, he's a great shooter. He's got a nose for score the net. He can score. Sure. I mean, that's not the question. The question is, can he score enough to make the Coyotes a playoff team this year? Because quite he honestly, have enough guys to set him up, though. It's one thing when you're right. playing with the superstars that he was, especially in Pittsburgh. But, you know, he's not going to have that in Arizona. I, I think they're an up and coming team. I think they got a good chance of making the playoffs. But, uh, you know, he doesn't have the same support of Cassidy that he had. Yeah, and, and Arizona's young. Uh, you know, their players are still developing, and, and a lot of them were in the American Hockey League uh, in Tucson last year, year before, uh, and they've started to come up. And, you know, they're just starting to get the training wheels off, if you will, at the NHL level. And I think last year was a great step forward for that team. I think they'll take another one this year. Um, it's just will they be able to separate themselves enough and generate the goals? They haven't so far. Uh, Arizona. 
Arizona. They got shut out the other night. Um, they've scored one goal so far in two games. Not a great start, but you know maybe it'll take a little time for the chemistry to get going there. Let me throw a couple names at you and see what you think. All Guys right. that um, I think Marner, in, when you give somebody that much money, expectations go up so high. Toronto, I know we keep, I don't know why this topic of Toronto keeps coming up, but it just does in tonight's show. But Marner, I think in Toronto, that's that's a lot of money to pay to a guy. You you better you better have a great season. Or that, The other guy that I'm interested in seeing as well, for different reasons, I always enjoy number one pick is going to perform. And I think Jack Hughes in New Jersey, while they don't, get the same kind of market coverage as, as other teams but i think anytime that you're a number one overall pick uh, I, I i like seeing how a young player like that is going to play so i, I i'm to me a couple of guys under the spotlight for two completely different reasons uh, marner in, in toronto and hughes in new jersey what do you think i did have hughes on my list um Marner, I think, can kind of hide a little bit with the other guys getting paid in Toronto right now with uh, Tavares and especially Austin Matthews is going to be the spotlight, I think, uh, for Toronto. But Marner, to me, I think Marner's really a, a big cog in that wheel, uh, more so than some people may even understand. And I think it, it was justified in making sure that he didn't go anywhere. I think he's a key component to Toronto's that's, chance. That's to win. A- no, it's a lot. That's a huge amount of money. It's a, but that's today's <laughs> NHL, isn't it? I mean, like we talked about earlier, this is this is where the money's going, and it, this is uh, a right, here, see. But here, here's my thing, and t- tell me if you disagree with this, and I'll probably talk about this all through the whole season. My thing is, somebody that much money, I. Or when you go out of town to other arenas. It should be a guy that people are going. Let's say he comes, uh, he comes to New Jersey to play. Devils fans there going buy a ticket to go watch this guy play. Mitch Marner in other cities are dying to buy a ticket to go watch play. Probably not. Um, and him that much money then if he's not that kind of a player. Right, and Austin Matthews is the guy you're buying a ticket to go watch play. John Tavares you're going to watch play. Uh, but but this is the bridge deal world we live in now where guys are coming out, they're restricted, they're getting their big contracts while they're restricted. It's You talk about a different world than the salary cap era, and at least we know we have labor peace for a little while, but this is kind of the new scourge that's putting GMs behind the eight ball. It's not the seven-year deal for the guy you're trying to bring in or the eight-year deal for the guy you're trying to keep. Now it's the guy's uh, a restricted free agent. You're rolling the dice. You're paying him a lot. But are you under or overpaying him based on where he might be in three years? You don't know. You're rolling the dice, and you could get sacked with a bad contract. That's mm-hmm. that's where all these GMs are, are really taking a chance. And But that's now the new reality in the nhl is a lot of guys are trying to go for those bucks off their rfa and and that's changing the economics of the game and Mar- marner's a great example of that it's it's the it's the decision that to make and it's the decision that the player has to make there do i believe enough in myself after my entry level contract or my first three years do i believe in myself enough a two-year or three-year deal over the for that or eight six seven or eight year deal and then maybe by the end of that you're being underpaid but you know the general manager then has to think am i rolling the dice that this guy's not going to be what we think he's going to be by the by the eighth year if we give the give my player on my team an eight-year deal but if it works out then you know, I mean, look at McKinnon and his 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 deal. His deal looks like a steal now. Yeah, but but see, if he had gone for maybe you know a, a two year deal or three year deal, now he'd be up for you know for dollars. 
Yeah, and that's that's get, the gamble on both sides. Right, you're rolling the dice. You're rolling the dice. That's exactly what it is. All right, one more guy I want to throw out there. No, how is no one talking about this? Thirty-seven-year-old Henrik Lundqvist. No one is talking about the fact that the Rangers window. I think it closed a couple of seasons ago. They've got a guy who admittedly is the king of New York, um, but there's no. I, I would be dangling Henrik Lundqvist, trying to get him out there somewhere. I don't know that he's the horse you can ride to take you deep into the playoffs anymore. He's going to uh, win some not. games. But how how is there not more attention on where Henrik Lundqvist is right now or what he should be doing or where he should be going? Can you, can you remind me? He still has plenty of years left on his deal, right? He's not at the end of his contract. No, I think he's got two or three more left. Yeah, I this is where so. we need Jay. Jay pretty, knows all this stuff. Pretty good salary. I, you know, I I, I grew up as, as a kid. I was a that was that was the Rangers were my team. I, I love the Rangers and and Eddie Jockman, the goalie, was my my guy when I was growing up. The goalie. So, I, I have a s- small passion in my heart for for New York Ranger goaltenders. So, but as much as he is loved in that town. For a lot of reasons, well, cup, close, but that's that's a guy. Rangers, that's a ridiculous amount of money to have to pay a player at that age. You're not going to be winning right now. That's a player that I I hate to say it, uh, and the Ranger fans are be sad, but it makes sense, doesn't it, Tom? You, you got to deal him. He, that's a guy team on the cusp or a team that thinks we need for this year is is, is a goaltender i think that that's going to be uh, in the trade talks all year long don't you don't you believe that yeah. that's what you're trying to say right yeah i think so or at least he should be i don't know if he will be but in my opinion i think he should be um just and, and the last jay next next week uh, the length of his contract <laughs> that might be it'd be one thing if he's on the last year of his deal Hard it, if he has three years left at uh, is it eight million? I want to say uh, if that's the case, I don't know. I don't how many teams are going to trade for a thirty-seven year old who's who, uh, you know, you don't know how much gas he's got left in the tank, and then you still would have another two years at that price for him. You, you it, better it have might a not backup. be that easy to trade. Yeah, and it you will. Have to eat that too, and I that would think. Well, that's the other thing too that you have to consider is that whoever's taking on that contract has to have the room to take on that contract and that's not easy in today's nhl either so. right but uh, you know what but a team that's contending and has an injury to a goaltender he'll certainly be one of the guys that's talked about that's for sure all right uh last one this one comes from the chat um jonathan drew is he potential trade bait montreal can't seem to turn the corner um I don't think Montreal makes the playoffs again this year. I love Carey Price. I think he's amazing. I love watching the guy every single night that he's on. But, um, Mike, I just don't see Montreal getting back into the playoffs this year. And maybe he's another guy. Canadians fans will riot when I say this. But maybe he's another guy you should look at kind of moving. Oh, oh man. That that would be a, there would be a riot <laughs> in the streets. Uh Druin's an interesting guy, isn't he? I, I, he's got to find the right team. The right, he is so much talent, and he's so much fun to watch. Find that right place for him. There, I know in the NHL, there's some team, there's some line that he he can he can join that that he's going to be able to flourish. He's, he's just got too much ability. I, I I just think he's so much fun to watch. Um, but that's an, that's that is certainly a guy that. Boy, if you're if you're Montreal and you don't think you're making the playoffs, uh, and and you're a team that's contending, why wouldn't you think that's a guy that could, could get you a, you know a, a goal or two when you really need it in the playoffs? Yeah, I would love to have a, a Drouin if I had the room for him. Uh, you want to talk about a secondary scoring addition? I think he can be a guy yeah. in the right situation. Um, right. right. Yeah. What if you're Arizona and you're on the cusp? Would you want a Duran on that roster? Put, put him with a Kessel. Make him a setup guy. That's a, that's an interesting pair, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I I wonder how that would I, work. 
mean, if you know what, you know, they, they, they stirred up a little bit for sure. And, uh, I, I, I like it. I, I think he's a guy that would become very attractive if Montreal is not doing well this season. Yes. Well, Mike, it's hard to believe, but we've, we've come to the end of an hour, uh, and the end hour? of the first show, oh. I think. So first show in the books, but, uh, is, I think that's it for me. Yeah. It was, well, <laughs> it's it, it, it was absolutely perfect, but uh, I want to say thanks to everybody for joining us, and Mike, my thanks to you for joining us here on the broadcast as well, and I look forward to doing this all season long. Tom, thank you again for including me. It was it was a lot of fun, and it uh, feels like we just sort of scraped the uh, the surface of, of hockey talk, and there's, there's plenty of things. It, it, it never fails to amaze you, isn't it? As the season goes along, things happen. Things, there will be lots and lots to talk about, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank there, you. there definitely will be things to talk about. So that's Mike Haynes. Uh, I'm Tom Callahan. Next week, Jay Levin will return to join us. Talking Puck, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time, every Sunday. You can follow along on the blog as well, TalkingPuck.com. But thanks for tuning us in here on Twitch TV. We'll talk to you again soon. Next week.